Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be experiencing part two of a new vision of the unexplained. My guest today is Professor Jeffrey Kripal, who is the J. Newton Razor Professor of Philosophy and Religious Thought and the former chair of the Department of Religious Studies at Rice University in Houston, Texas. He is co-author with Whitley Strieber of The Supernatural, A New Vision of the Unexplained. He is also co-author with Elizabeth Crone of Changed in a Flash, One Woman's Near-Death Experience and Why a Scholar Thinks It Empowers Us All. In addition, he has written Authors of the Impossible, The Paranormal and the Sacred, Mutants and Mystics, Science Fiction, Superhero Comics and the Paranormal, Kali's Child, The Mystical and Erotic in the Life and Teachings of Ramakrishna, and Secret Body, Erotic and Esoteric Currents in the History of Religions. This is yet another internet interview, so now I will switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. Once again, we'll be reviewing uh, this incredible adventure that Whitley Strieber has has been on now for over three decades. Uh, I should think uh, for a person such as yourself, a historian of religion, this is uh, the equivalent of, of being with a, um, a real uh, live uh, religious phenomenon of some sort. Well, that's certainly how it feels. That's that's why I'm so committed to it, or one of the reasons. I mean, it's you know, it's sort of like being at the front row of a really, really good um, Super Bowl or something. It's it's quite it's quite the thing to watch and, and to, frankly to interact with. It's not really like being at the Super Bowl because when you're at the Super Bowl, all you can do is holler and yell, and nothing really changes on the field. Where with Whitley, you know, we we talk and things change he he responds and so it's kind of a living morphing thing that's happening and and i haven't counted but there does seem to be a really wide variety of different phenomena that occur in his presence uh, materializations out of body experience sexual experiences uh, uh, lights and sounds and uh, yeah he's yeah He's he's radioactive, uh, and and a wide variety. Uh, I guess you'd call them entities, or maybe even creatures that seem to appear. Yep, yep. I mean, again, that's I, he's you know he's it's sort of um, you know John Keel would call it a Disneyland of the paranormal. Uh, you know mm-hmm. that, that's putting it too dismissively, but it it's extraordinary and. You know, usually I don't witness these things. I hear about them secondhand, but but I have, you know, I have been around some of this with him, and uh, it's not all just secondhand. Mm-hmm. It, it it really happens. I mean, you've experienced things in his presence yourself. Um, yes. I mean, I have. I. It's complicated to talk about because some of it's so personal and involves other people that. Mm. I don't feel comfortable talking about those events, but, but yeah, I, um, you know, I invite Whitley pretty regularly to Esalen to these symposia I lead and occasionally we'll room together, you know, he'll be my roommate and mm-hmm. he always jokes going in, you know, about, well, you may not want to do that. And, you know, we kind of laugh about it, but, but things have happened mm-hmm. and, um, you know, may, maybe we can begin there. I mean, I, right. I I actually did one night. I mean, I usually when these things happen to Willie, he's the sole witness, um, or people see strange things around the events, but they don't see what Willie sees. And the one instance that I was sort of involved in, it's hard to explain like many of these things, but 
he had been um I don't know if he told you, but, you know, he's often woken up in the middle of the night by these visitors, as he calls them. And then he meditates in the middle of the night, usually yeah. around three or four in the morning. And so this is very apparent if you're his roommate, because, you know, your your roommate is up at three or four in the morning sitting in a chair meditating. So I, you know, on some level, I knew that this was happening every night. But one night um, I, I I was asleep. But it was like I split off into a second personality, and I heard my own voice in my head say, oh, my God. You know, like this other part of me was witnessing whatever was going on over by Whitley, and it was shocked and and kind of terrified by this. This other part of me was witnessing something in the room and was reacting in this kind of shocked awe. But my, my sleeping self was completely clueless. So it was, it was very weird. It was, I, I had literally split off into two, two different people that split that I, you know, I'm referring to there was not subtle. There was a part of me that was clearly witnessing something and it was, talking in a way that this other part of me was hearing but had zero access to. I mean, there were really two distinct subjects at that moment. And uh, I, I never had anything like that. And then um, a little later in, the, in that same night, I heard a crash. Something crashed and fell. But again, it was, it was in my head that I heard this, and I wasn't for sure that it was in the room and I woke up. I mean, the crash was so loud. I woke up and I looked all around the room and nothing had fallen, nothing had broken. So within a cor the course of about two hours there, some part of me had witnessed something that the other part of me hadn't and something had mimicked or replicated a crash. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I woke up the next morning and of course told Whitley about it. And then he went, on to explain what he had experienced that night, which is essentially the visitors again. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that an ex is that a direct experience? Well, sort of. Yeah. Uh, but not direct to to this Jeff you're talking about. You're right. Talking to it, right now. It's very personal, but I, I don't think it would count very much in a in a parapsychological discussion of evidence. No, it's not. It's not evidence at all. Yeah. But. But in my own experience, I don't need the evidence because that was my experience. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, something happened around a sleeping Whitley streamer across the room, and um, you know, it was it was inexplicable. Well, I think uh, as I read through the book, one of the most fascinating uh, aspects of it was your discussion of the distinction between imaginary and imaginal and how yeah. that pertains to w Whitley's experiences. For me, the, the key, the, the thing we trip over and the thing that prevents us as a culture now from really understanding these sorts of individuals and these sorts of experiences is that we lack any real theory of the imagination. All that we have in our culture is that that which is imagined is imaginary. And so that then gets dismissed as purely subjective hallucination or illusion. But the more you look at these things, the more you begin to suspect that sometimes, not always, that the imagination is the organ of mediation that whatever's in the environment is communicating to you or to the subject actually through the imagination. Um, and so what's being imagined is not exactly there. It's not what's appearing, but something's really there. Mm -hmm. And so it's this weird kind of real, unreal kind of zone that you're put in. Um, and to me, it, if we can move in that direction, I think we'll, we'll be much smarter about these things. We won't interpret them literally, necessarily, but we also won't dismiss them. Mm -hmm. 
You um, refer but, to the uh, biological aspect of, of the origin of the word imaginal, that it had something uh, to do when it was conceived of by you know, various philosophers like Henri Corbin as a, uh, a way in which the caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Right. So people who know about the category of the imaginal think that it was coined by Henri Corbin, who was this really gifted historian of Persian mysticism uh, and Sufism um, uh, in the middle of the 20th century, essentially, was when he was prominent. He was French. He was a student of Louis Massignon's, another really fascinating and, and great historian of Sufism. And Corbin used this category of the imaginal really throughout his work to describe this mediating space, what he, what he called the intermediate world. And for him, it was, it was very real, but it was also visionary. He, he kind of lived and thought in this, this intermediate world. But in fact, he didn't coin the term or invent it at all. It, it had already been used fairly extensively, um, by previous writers, uh, including um, help Fred, me out here, Jeffrey. Frederick Myers. Well, Frederick Myers is the original, but but there was also um, a French uh, a French writing psychiatrist who wrote a book called um, "From India to the Planet Mars." Flournoy. Yeah, so Flournoy. So <laughs> Flournoy had used it. Um, before, well before Corbin, and had actually tutored Jung. And so Jung got it from Flournoy, but Flournoy got it from Frederick Myers. Mm -hmm. Frederick Myers, I think, is the real source of this term. He's this Victorian British uh, classicist and psychical researcher who really thinks that these are sort of organs of cognition that are evolving very gradually and gradually appearing in the species. And for him, he got it from entomology. 19th century entomologists distinguish between the larval stage of an insect and the imaginal stage of an insect. The larval stage was the, the worm, the, the gooey, you know, the caterpillar crawling around on the, on the leaf and eating the plant. The imago or the perfect image or the imaginal form of the insect was, in this case, the butterfly. So when Myers described things like telepathy and apparitions of the dead and, and precognition, when he described those as imaginal forms of experience, he, was, he meant this sort of evolutionary sense of something moving from a larval immature stage to a, a more perfect developed stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then that gets picked up by Flournois and Jung and eventually Corbin, and it, it takes on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. But it really, I think, goes back to Myers and ultimately to, to entomology. And if we apply that to uh, human beings such as ourselves, you, me, and Whitley, uh, it, the suggestion is that the there's further evolution uh ahead of, of the human species and that uh, these experiences may be part of an evolutionary process. That's right. That was clearly Myers's belief. Mm -hmm. He believed that what he called supernormal experiences, which we now call paranormal, but it's very much related, um, were buds kind of, they were sort of evolutionary buds that were trying to push through, you know, the dirt as it were and to appear and, you know, Myers told this funny story of all of these caterpillars sitting around chewing on their leaf and this beautiful butterfly comes in and lands and the caterpillars are like, you know, what the hell? What, 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 what's that? You know, um, so they, they had almost no conception that they themselves will eventually mature into this flying winged thing that is looks nothing like them. And yet is them. Mm -hmm. And that's what Myers really felt about this whole realm we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what Whitley suggests a lot in his own writings. He sees 
the visitors as essentially the butterfly landing on the leaf with the caterpillars. And we're like, what the hell? I mean, what is this? But it's actually us. Mm -hmm. We just don't recognize it as us. And Whitley is also quite convinced that these experiences he's been having are really physical. That's where I hesitate. Mm -hmm. Just not, not because I don't believe Whitley. It's because I, I hesitate because it just sort of breaks all of our models. You know, I, it, that's where it's so hard to deal with this because it, again, I think our inclination is to move back to the subjective and, and the mental or the spiritual. But what Willie's saying is, no, this physically happened to me. Someone was physically in my room. Mm -hmm. They did physical things to me. They physically put a, uh, an implant in my ear right here. And then he, you know, he points to it and, and shows you when it turns red. And I mean, <laughs> these are physical things for him, not, yeah. not, not just spiritual, as we say. I was particularly impressed by one story in which, uh, uh, it's very complex, but at the end of the story, he sees some large spiders, like a foot wide or a foot and a half wide, on the ceiling of of his room, and he he feels that he has to protect his wife, who's in bed next to him, from these spiders, and he jumps on top of her, and and which for him is a demonstration that he's willing to risk his life for his wife. That's how he feels emotionally about it. But then once he's done that and satisfied the the need to demonstrate that to himself, they disappear. What is that? You know, <laughs> would, would have Anne seen those spiders, you know, if she woke up? I probably not. But um, it, it does seem to me that, that Whitley is quite sincere when, when he says for him, they're very tangible. Oh, no question. The, no, there, no question. The man is not lying. He's mm. not making stuff up. He's, he's trying to, be honest with his readers about what he experienced, what he saw, what he felt, what was done to him. And, um, yeah, for me, that's not even a question. The question of honesty uh, or fraud is, is, is answered in my mind just because I know Whitley. I think we ought to address it a little bit because he's such a talented writer and he had a yep. history of writing horror novels. And I think yep. he's very gifted at, at just telling the story and embellishing yep. it in, in such a captivating way that the temptation is, is to think that maybe his creative faculties have gotten the best of him. And he's, he's just, uh, this is just another wonderful mystery that he's creating. So I think there's two things to say. One is I really believe these experiences are about his literary genius. Mm. I think they're aimed at creativity and the production of the novels and the books. I, I think they're intimately linked to that. Mm. So that's one thing to say. The other thing to say is, you know, I have read, um, I'm in the process of reading hundreds and eventually thousands of private um, or personal accounts of abduction experiences by people all across the country, really in Europe, Canada, Mexico, um, from all walks of life. And what strikes me about so many of these accounts is how badly they're written. Um, and it's because most people can't write. Jeffrey, that's mm. that's just that's just an observation. It's not a judgment. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these accounts don't even make grammatical sense. They don't know where to put the period or the comma or what to capitalize. They're a mess. Mm. They're a total mess. And so when you read them as a reader, it's hard to take them seriously because the form they come to you in is 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 just such a mess. Mm. But I know, I also know on another level that actually the literary form or disform of the expression may have nothing to do, probably has nothing to do with the genuineness and power of the original experience. And I, but I think we confuse those, you know? And so when you get someone like Whitley Strieber, 
who not only has these hundreds of these extraordinary experiences, but is a professional writer, then you get this kind of wow effect. And then that then makes you suspicious. But I think personally, we should have the opposite response is thank goodness we finally have someone who can write and can articulate what happened to him or her because that's really rare. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we should be approaching Whitley's books as sort of, you know, literary gifts that are ac precise and accurate in a way that other accounts cannot be. Um, again, for no moral fault of the person writing, but the person simply cannot write a sentence. Mm -hmm. Now, you list several reasons why uh, you accept Whitley's experiences uh, as authentic. Uh, one of them is that uh, when he had his initial contact back in 1985, there was a huge UFO flap going on uh, in upstate New York uh, for a period of actually decades prior to, prior to that. So his experiences fit into a well-known context. Yeah, yeah. I... I don't have any doubt that these things happened to Whitley um, because of that broader context and be, and not just that Hudson Valley century long context. I mean, we're talking about millennia of religious experience of strange creatures coming from the sky and doing even stranger things to, to us. Mm -hmm. So this is nothing new. This, this is as old as it gets. This is as universal as it gets. This is as religious as it gets. None of that means I believe the mythologies or the religions that spin out of these experiences. I don't, actually. So uh, what I was trying to articulate in the book was this kind of paradoxical position that I think we need to inhabit where – we recognize that these are real experiences, but we want to be smarter about how they get picked up and turned into cultures and religions and civilizations. Mm -hmm. In an earlier conversation, uh, you and I talked about uh, your recent book, Secret Body, and there yeah. you uh, mentioned that you had actually had an experience of your own that uh, uh, resonated quite a bit with uh, some of the claims, some of the strong claims Whitley had made about, for example, having a powerful sexual experience with this uh, female entity that he called a visitor right yeah i mean again that's that's another reason i believe whitley mm -hmm. is i had a similar experience now when i had it in 1989 i was living in in calcutta or what is now Col kolkata and it was in the context of a, a hindu tantric uh, ritual and and set of cultural beliefs um and it made total sense in that cultural context. But it also makes really good sense in Whitley Strieber's visitor context. I, I could go either way easily. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I don't believe the one any more than I believe the other. That's the point, is it can fit into all of these cultural contexts mm -hmm. and all of these mythologies almost effortlessly. And to me, that's the... That's the power of these experiences, but that's also why we, I think, need to st step back a bit. You're suggesting, I think Whitley is also suggesting, that what we need to get at is the underlying phenomenology that leads uh, people to uh, interpret them in terms of religions or in terms of a UFO mythology or the little people or, or some other form of folklore. Right. And, hmm. you know... There may not be an underlying phenomenology. I mean, the, the the visionary apparition might itself be the phenomenology, might be what is appearing to us. And But there is something behind that or underneath that that we may never be able to describe or put our finger on. But I think we can still recognize that these experiences share a lot of features across cultures and times and they're also very different. Mm -hmm. 
and this is why, you know, at the end of the day, I'm always, you know, preaching for better forms of comparison. How, how do we negotiate those samenesses and those differences? You describe a, a particular methodology that is used in the humanities. Uh, yeah. It was a very elegant description of uh, what we call hermeneutics. And yeah. uh, let's go into that because I've, I've never read a better description of it than uh, the one well, you put forth in that book. Well, thanks. So hermeneutics is a Greek-based word. It actually goes back to the god Hermes who was a trickster, by the way, so that should key us off right away. But hermeneutics is simply, uh, well, not simply, hermeneutics is the way that academics talk about interpretation. And the idea is not that a text or an experience has a single correct interpretation, and our job is to get to that single or correct interpretation. The idea is that the text or the experience is like a is like a living thing, like a living matrix of possibilities or potentials, and that when a reader or an interpreter interacts with it, a particular kind of interpretation arises in the middle between that reader and the text or the experience. So what appears is as dependent on the interpreter as it is on that which is being interpreted. It, there's a kind of fusion that that takes place there. And um, that's just, that's what we mean by hermeneutics. And, you know, to relate this to another, something else that people, I think, might go to, this is where I think a lot of speculation about quantum physics is essentially hermeneutical, that you know, the wave function doesn't exist until the 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 photon is observed, mm. and then the wave function collapses. And what people like Niels Bohr saw immediately, whether he was right or wrong, is that it appears that there's something about conscious observation that actually affects physical reality and causes the wave function to collapse and to behave in a, a particular way. That's a beautiful actual analogy for what we mean by hermeneutics, is that the text or the experience is like this wave function. It's potential. It's all over the place. It's just a smear of possibilities. And the reader or the interpreter comes in and the thing collapses and becomes one meaning or one mm -hmm. story or one thing. Uh, and so to me, that's, a, that's actually a beautiful analogy mm -hmm. for what what we're trying to get at. I think I understand now why in our previous interview about Elizabeth Crone's experience of a, a near-death experience, you said that we are changing the afterlife. Yeah, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Is the afterlife is like this, you know, quantum schmear of possibilities and that we're, as we interpret it through these near-death experiences and people like Elizabeth, it takes on a particular shape. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the afterlife, of course, Whitley makes a real point that these experiences having are interwoven with uh, what appear to be post-mortem contacts of various kinds. Right. Yeah. This is, by the way, another time where I had direct or indirect experiences with Whitley. It, it, it involved Anne, actually, mm -hmm. you know, his, his departed uh, beloved wife. I, I knew Anne when she was alive. And, uh, in fact, when she died, Whitley asked me to come to uh, the family ranch and do one of the readings for the memorial. It happened to be a sermon from Meister Eckhart, the great um, Christian medieval mystical writer and preacher. Um, but, you know, a year and a half later or so, <laughs> uh, a woman from Canada actually started to receive messages from Anne. And, and um, she sent them to me because um, I, no, I had known her. And she didn't tell me they were from Anne. She didn't know they were from Anne. She thought they were from Princess Leia hmm. <laughs> of Star hmm. Wars. And she sent me this drawing. And... Um, I'm just going to tell you the real briefly the story. It's a long story, but basically she sent me this drawing, and I 
I didn't recognize it. I didn't make much of it. I was sort of absorbed in my own life and family at the moment. But I showed it to a colleague, and uh, Diana said, Jeff, that's Ann Strieber. And I was like, holy crap, you're right. Th that is Ann Strieber. And I showed it, then asked the woman if I could show it to Willie, and and Whitley then put the, pic the drawing on one place and a photograph of Ann on the other, and it was clearly based on the on the photograph. I mean, it was just a spin image. But as I looked at the the um, drawing more and more, I realized that the word Ann was written dozens and dozens of times all through the hair and the face and the nose, and that the the artist had somehow unconsciously written Anne probably 20, 30 times. And uh, so anyway, this story spins out, but, but the upshot is, is that we came to this conclusion that, that it appeared that Anne was communicating with Whitley through this little social network that we had, and that each of us was partic each of us was providing a piece of the puzzle. Diana had a piece, I had a piece, this woman from Canada had a piece, and none of it would have come together without all of us. So it was as if there was like this sociology of a seance going on, you know, across hundreds and thousands of miles. And and the result was really having a really profound, quite moving encounter with his with his dead wife. Well, this um, sounds quite reminiscent to me of uh, what was at one time known as the cross correspondences. Yeah, I no, I thought of that. I thought of that. It, it wasn't quite as complicated as that, um, but it clearly had that feel that th with this particular paranormal event, there was no way to read it as just one person's private experience it actually made no sense to the woman who it, to whom it first appeared it only took on meaning through this social network well and that uh, was the strategy of presumably employed by frederick myers who we spoke about earlier yeah. after his own death uh it, it seemed as if he was attempting to establish proof of his post-mortem existence by uh, communicating through different mediums on different continents even and giving yeah. them pieces of a puzzle that only made sense when the pieces came together I, I know. I thought of that when it was happening. Um, As if Anne was really trying to provide proof of her postmortem existence. Well, we were all, we all we were all convinced. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, here, Jeffrey, I I talk about the two bars. So, you know, to take this communication from Anne, the the first bar, the low bar, is these experiences explained to me perfectly reasonably why people historically have believed in an afterlife why they believe their loved ones survive why they believe there's something like a soul once you have this experience it's really impossible not to entertain those ideas yep. and maybe to believe them mm -hmm. and it's clearly impossible then to think that people are irrational or unreasonable for holding those views because it just happened to you you know, it's, you can't deny that. Okay. So that's the low bar, why people believe impossible things. The high bar is these impossible things are true, right? Mm. I actually can't get over that high bar. I can't get my readers over it. I can't get my listeners over it. I don't think it's possible, actually, to get people over that bar. Um, but I think it's very possible to get over the low bar, you know, and I think once we make that distinction, I mean, it may be true. I I personally think it's true, but it may not be true. And I don't think we can prove it. Mm. I, I don't think this is a matter of science. I don't think it's pseudoscience. I don't think it has anything to do with science. I, I think it has to do with people experiencing these things. And they're not repeatable. They're not measurable. Um, but they're they're certainly part of our reality. And and I think it's, so it's very easy to get over this bar, but but it's very hard and, and perhaps not even possible to get over the high bar. Mm -hmm. I know that you wrote in your book that you don't want people to make the mistake of thinking that you believe Whitley is uh, the equivalent of, let's say, a Hebrew prophet. 
Uh, but when I listened to him uh, <laughs> yesterday, he came across very much in that vein, in particular yeah. with regard to his interest in ecology and in saving the planet from the destruction yeah. that humans seem to be creating. And he, he seemed to feel that he had been downloaded, I think was the word he used. They downloaded uh, information for him that would be important that we could use to uh, clean up the uh, problem that we have on the planet right now and he seems so desperate to get people to listen to him on that score and so hurt when his ideas are rejected. He, he's not like the Hebrew prophets in the sense that we no longer have a recognized institution of prophecy yeah. in our culture. That's for sure. And the ancient Israelites seem to have. I mean, I'd like to talk to a historian about that, but it seems like they actually had, you know, institutionalized, really, this notion of prophecy. You know, some of the greatest Hebrew prophets were actually employed at the court. I mean, they were literally worked for the king. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have a prophet in the president's cabinet, <laughs> to, put it, to put it really mildly. Yeah. Uh, and what I did say about Whitley in this book, which I completely... Uh, and completely convinced of, I see Whitley as an American shaman, which is another way of calling him a prophet, um, but it's more indigenous. But he lives in a culture in which there are no shamans. So, again, I think this is why Whitley suffers so, is he has these gifts, he has access to the other world, the other world is constantly speaking to him. He has messages for us as a public culture, but our public culture does not recognize that other world or the role of the shaman or the role of the prophet. So Whitley comes across to people as just, you know, another um, another crazy person. Mm -hmm. um, and all that means is, is we lack utterly any cultural context for what this man is experiencing. Well, um, one of the reasons I take Whitley very seriously is is because many of his experiences are re reminiscent of uh, what I uncovered in a 10-year case study I did with Ted Owens, who called himself the PK man and had uh, all sorts of similar experiences to those reported by Whitley. And, and like Whitley, he worked throughout his life to interest scientists in, in what he uh, had done. And and produce many, many demonstrations that seem to be uh, uh, evidence of psychokinetic abilities or perhaps even a telepathic connection with some sort of extraterrestrial or hyperdimensional beings. I, I love this book, Jeff. It, it sits here in my office right on my desk so I can, like, tempt people with it. It's a very, <laughs> cool, it's a very cool cover, too, by the way. I, I think you're right. I mean, I think that's a really powerful uh comparison and i don't i don't know if you remember in the book with elizabeth crone but i i have a whole section on lightning lore yeah you know and this notion of getting hit by lightning and becoming a, a visionary or a shaman is is very very um distributed and very old as well um but yeah i, I just think you're right I, I i just think that's correct and with the case the ted owens case um there again, you have this really weird mix of something mental and something very, very physical. Mm -hmm. In this case, atmospheric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's just, oh my God. Yeah. I but I, I suppose the unique feature of Whitley's experience is that, in effect, it began with a rape. And, and yeah. he explained to me that he still suffers the physical consequences of having some sort of an instrument inserted into his rectum. Yeah. Yep. And, and again, that's not unique either. Um, trauma, physical trauma, sexual abuse, uh, wartime trauma, uh, emotional trauma um, lies at the origin point of a lot of saints and prophets and visionary figures um there's something about trauma that that cracks people open you know i have a whole chapter in the book on trauma actually mm -hmm. um 
And of course, usually what happens with trauma is it just um, maims us forever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a horrible thing. I'm not, I don't want to romanticize it in any way. But for some people, it cracks them open and they later develop these gifts or these abilities. I don't know if Elizabeth Crone talked to you about this, but you know, she traces her near death experience not just back to the lightning strike, but to six years of being sexually abused as a, a little girl. Oh, yes, of course, we talked and, about that. And I don't mean an adolescent mm -hmm. or a teenager, I mean a little girl. Yeah. This, this poor thing was uh, uh, raped essentially for six years. And she learned to dissociate. Between the ages of 6 and 12, as I recall. Yeah. Yeah. And Elizabeth is just adamant that that ability to dissociate is what allowed her to survive the lightning strike. In your chapter, you relate trauma to trance. Yes. Yep. And to transcendence. Mm -hmm. Yep. I really believe that. And, you know, Willie, Willie is just as clear about this. He, he has always, as far back as I can read him, maybe not in communion, but certainly in the books after that, traced his visitor experiences back to his childhood trauma on a military base. And he could, ne could never remember what the, what the abuse or trauma was, but he was always really clear about that. Mm -hmm. um, but he doesn't... He doesn't he never says that the visitors are just psychic projections of this earlier trauma. He thinks the trauma again split him open in some way and it allowed access with whatever the visitors are later in life. Mm -hmm. That's a different argument. Yeah. It it is, but it uh it also um has this sense in Whitley's experience that he is being uh, taken possession of that th these beings really uh, want to control him that they uh, raped him as a way of breaking his spirit so that and now he loves them he uh, almost worships uh, these experiences uh, in spite of all of the pain and discomfort he 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 describes it in, in the most positive terms with the biggest smile on his face it makes him happy in a way that nothing else seems to do especially since the death of his wife yeah no that's right but you know that again i discussed this in the book the supernatural this this notion that the sacred is both terrifying uh dangerous and filled with awe and beauty is again. That's just it's. That's how humans have responded to mm -hmm. this presence for forever, or for as long as we can see back. the The holy is not the good. Um, the holy is the powerful, um, and and the awesome. Um, so I mean, yeah, absolutely. Well, it seems as if humans. Uh are always fascinated with power and, and wish to uh, accumulate more and more power that uh, we're drawn to it. It's, you know, it's touching the light socket. Do you, <laughs> do you really want to put the fork in the, in the, in, in the, the outlet on the wall? And, you know, you kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's how much power can you take? You yeah. know, I mean, when I, my, one of my, guilty memories as a child was convincing my little brother to touch the electric fence on our grandma and grandpa's farm with a steel rod you know and so that's not gonna it's not gonna kill you but it's really gonna shock the heck out of you yeah. and um and there's something awesome about that experience but there's also something bad about it mm -hmm. and uh, most people, uh, if they've had one experience like that, they don't go back for a second one. But Whitley seems to be different in that regard. Well, I, I don't think that his experiences are touching the electric fence. I, I think, you know, it's they, they have this ecstatic uh, um, and, and as frankly, aesthetic quality to them mm -hmm. that, that that is um, – that draws one back in. Mm -hmm. Well, I personally am fascinated by the uh, 
apparent, ostensible, real concrete physical aspects of this. Uh, he went into some length with me about the incident where the uh, implant was supposedly put into his ear and what happened to the alarm system in his house at the time, how the garage door was open, but the alarm didn't go off. And right. a, a worker came and found an unusual magnetic field there that uh, apparently interfered with the alarm system, but they couldn't find any source for the magnetic field. It, it certainly suggests that a, a diligent scientist could pursue him and might come up with some uh, really concrete findings. Maybe. Um, I mean, that's the point in our book together where I feel like I really failed. Hmm. I, um, I don't really... I mean, that story's in our book. Yes. Uh, and he, he's told it elsewhere. Yeah, it's not yeah. it's not unique to our book. But I, I didn't know what to do with that story. I mean, do I? Because it implies that there are forces and there are human beings who are intentionally doing this to other human beings, on, you know, under cover of darkness, as it were. And maybe that's true. I, but I, I, I don't. I stumble there in the book, and I, you know, basically I point out that actually. Getting objects implanted in your body is an old shamanic motif, too. Right. Um, and that maybe this was more of a visionary experience that, that Willie sort of translated into modern conspiracy terms. But I don't know. That feels like something of a cop-out to me, looking back on it. And I... I don't know what to do with that, Jeffrey. I'm just kind of yeah. at loss. Well, you are a religious scholar. You're not a paraphysicist. <laughs> no. How, however, it seems to me that in, in the religious literature, there are various examples, I think, in the life of Abraham and the Hebrew Torah, where angels of God come, but they appear like humans. Yeah. No, it's true. No, I. No, you're right. And... I do think there's something very physical or even electromagnetic mm -hmm. about these events. I just, um, again, I'm not a physicist or, or an electrician, so I, I don't, I wouldn't even know how to begin to study those things. But you did speculate in, yeah. in, in your book that we, we may have a, I think the way you put it is that we may have a soul which is like a luminous plasma. Yeah. Well, that's Whitley's idea, mm -hmm. and it, it's reasonable to me because, well, like with Elizabeth, too, you know, she sees auras around the human body. Um, there's nothing really that outrageous about positing some kind of electromagnetic dimension to the mm -hmm. human being. I mean, it seems like, I mean, the heart is basically an electrical system. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, clearly, there is electromagnetic stuff going on. For sure. Yeah, there better be or we're dead. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> you know, this reminds me of a story. Um, I, David Hufford is a friend of mine. I, I don't know if you've ever interviewed David, yeah. but he, he's written a wonderful book. It's, it's right here. It's called The Terror That Comes in the Night. Mm. And uh, he's, he's studied uh, sleep paralysis, among other things. Mm. But David is of the conviction that sleep paralysis events, at least some of them cannot be explained away um, and that there there do appear to be some kind of entities that interact with humans during these events. But he also wrote this book with this woman who um, had this massive kind of mystical opening in which the world became light for like days. And I remember asking David about what that meant and like, what do you mean light? Like, what do we mean when we say, I saw the light? Or, you know, is this the same thing as photons and me turning on a light? You know, is it or is it or is it not? You know, and David said, well, I actually asked, I think her name was Genevieve. I actually asked Genevieve whether she could read a newspaper by this light that she saw for like, again, days. And she said no. Hmm. So that to me is really, that's a really significant hint. Yeah. It doesn't mean the light wasn't there. It doesn't mean there is no such light. It just means we're probably talking about a physics or a light that is not, um, 
is not what the physicists are talking about with photons. Well, well, I understand that perfectly well because I experience tinnitus from time to time. It's a very distinct sound. I can hear it as if there were a bell ringing in the room, but I know nobody else can hear it but me. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, and it's your eardrum, right? Uh, I'm not quite sure where it's produced. I, I assume somewhere in the brain, but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So again, what what is the nature of these plasmas, or what is the nature of this electromag? Is it electromagnetic, or is it just some other kind of exotic energy or life force that we just don't even have language for? I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Of course. But you do write about other instances, for example, when people see these glowing orbs. Yeah. It's not just the experience of seeing a strange light hovering in the room or in the garden near you. It often involves a an experience of ecstasy. Yeah. I mean, you could write a whole history of religions around orbs of light. <laughs> I mean... That kind of, kind of what that's kind of what the history of religions is, right? <laughs> From Saint Paul to you know uh, the burning bush. Uh, I guess it start starts somewhere way back there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they have a they have a subjective component and they have an objective component, and those two things are resonating or working off each other. And uh, of course, the, I think the deeper metaphysical question that you're getting at in your work with uh, Whitley and what strikes me when you talk about a new vision of the unexplained is uh, the notion that consciousness itself, um, how can I put it, uh, maybe the simplest way to say it is that consciousness is capable of manifesting or creating phenomena in the physical world. That's basically what we call psychokinesis. That may be much more widespread than we realize. And if you want to take that further, maybe the physical world is a manifestation of consciousness. I mean, that's what a lot of these figures would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we call idealism. But... um, I think that's on the table here. And, I, uh, yeah, certainly our mutual friend Bernardo Kestrup has gone a, a long way to articulating the, uh, in very precise language the argument for exactly that, the idealist position. Yeah, I, yeah, and I'm very sympathetic to that. I, I think what you end up concluding if you look at this stuff long enough or you interact with it closely enough and most people can't, of course, I understand. Yeah. Um, is that consciousness is not just something going on in your brain, that it's somehow interwoven into the physical universe all around you as well. It's, it's, it's as basic and fundamental as gravity. Um, but what that means, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know where we go with that. Well, you conclude the book, as I recall, with a very interesting metaphor. You suggest that perhaps we are like the fictional characters in a movie, but we're also the author of the movie at the same time. Yeah. Now, that I actually do believe. I That was the basic idea of the authors of the Impossible book, right? I mean, that we're writing this stuff, but also experiencing it within it we're, we're, we, we don't that, that was the that was the argument of the book with elizabeth too that we're scripting these things but but not individually we're scripting them as cultures and families and generations and then our descendants experience the world in these terms and they think that's somehow external or objective but actually we wrote it <laughs> mm. uh, and again that doesn't mean it's just a series of fictions it, because of course the author of all of that is quite real we 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 just haven't turned around or or flipped and seen seen the author there's a fundamental paradox there in the nature of reality itself the paradox i suppose uh, that we think the subjective and the objective are two distinct things but they're not that would be my position mm mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Professor Jeffrey Kripal, uh, once again, this has been a real pleasure uh, uh, to have such a conversation about a topic that, is, as you point out, not everybody has the privilege of being able to think about these things. Uh, 
But, yeah. but I get a lot of feedback from our viewers that they're very grateful to be able to share in these conversations. And, and I'm very grateful that you were able to uh, create the time for it as well. Well, it is a privilege, Jeffrey. And, you know, um, none of us could do this without the people who have these experiences. Yeah. That's th- those are the real heroes here, um, not the geeks or the nerds or the the scientists trying to figure it out. I mean, we're we're doing our best, but the gifts actually lie with the experiencers, and that's where I just feel you know I feel nothing but um, a kind of awe and a kind of humility. Uh, and a kind of confusion, frankly. Well, I have to say I experienced all of those myself in uh, interacting with Whitley, but I'm hoping to uh, uh, have him come to Albuquerque so we can do more. Yeah, well, he'd be he'd be great at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't uh, you might want to think twice about room room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.